Now, right, folks, we're here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. I'm going to read to you the simple gospel message in 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you receive, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. So folks, there's the gospel. There it is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what Paul proclaimed to people. That's what all the apostles proclaimed to people. He said we all preach the same thing. And that's the same message that has been preached for thousands of years, for 2,000 years. And that's the same message we come to declare to you today is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And Jesus came for a specific purpose. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came so that sinners like you and I can be forgiven and be granted eternal life. And Jesus came preaching repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So my friends, you got to turn from your sin and turn to Christ and put your faith and your trust in Him and Him alone. Man wants to die and after this the judgment. So my friends, when you, when you draw your last breath on earth and you stand before your Creator in judgment, then He's going to judge you according to His righteousness. He's not going to ask you what you think you should be judged by, but He's going to judge you according to His righteousness. His law, if you will, is Ten Commandments. Who actually just, the Ten Commandments are actually a, a representation of the character of God. The very first one is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Can you always, can you say you've always had Jesus first and foremost in your life? The second one is, don't create any idols. You can create idols in your mind or you can carve them out of wood like little Buddhas. Either way, they're wrong, they're idols. So are you guilty of that? Commandment number three, which I know many of you are guilty of because I hear it all the time, is don't take the Lord your God's name in vain. Don't blaspheme. What's that? Would I worship God without the threat of hell? Well, sure. Sure. Because he's the creator. He created me. What's the point of your question? Are, are you just saying it's, it's a fear-mongering religion? Is that what your point is? No, certainly not. That's just the reality. I mean, do you go up and, and put your hand on a stove knowing it's hot? Sure not. Fear is a good thing. So you, you act like fear is a bad thing. But fear is actually a good motivator, is it not? Is it not, though? I, I mean, hell's a reality. So I, I just don't understand the question. Are, are, you, are you saying, are you, I don't understand the purpose, I guess, what I'm saying. So you're saying if there was no hell, would we still worship God? Or are we just worshiping out of fear? Is that, is that your point? Get okay, no, I, we're not worshiping out of fear or not. It's out of gratitude for what He's done for us. That's why you worship. The reality of hell is there, and it's a motivator, certainly. But once God saves you, you worship Him and serve Him out of gratitude for what He's done for you. Does that make sense? What's that? Okay. Have I cast a stone at you? What did I do? What did I do? I've never even talked to you before, I don't think. So he cast the stone at me, the guy flipped me off. Is he casting the stone at me? Why don't you go talk to him about that? <laughs> you repent with the trust in Christ. You come along. Yeah, you gotta turn from sin. You can't trust Christ without repentance. It's, it's two sides of the same coin. You, you can't help it. You have to turn your whole mind and attitude towards sin and will change. And you change, you turn towards Christ and you want to serve him and do right. You don't want to sin, okay? So folks, the young man came by and uh, said, let him with 
No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to discuss that with you right now. You can go talk to Rich. He'll discuss the 144,000 with you right there. I thought the young man came by and said, let him who was out sin cast the first stone. I think it was referencing when, when the, the, the Jews brought the woman called an adultery before Jesus. And now I went away when he confronted them about their sin. And my friends, we're not here to cast stones. We're here to cast the net of the gospel. That's why I'm here and beg you to turn from sin and turn to Christ and put your faith and trust in him for eternal salvation, for forgiveness of sin. Because my friends, on this earth, you may walk and do like you please and have a good time. And sin is certainly fun, pleases the flesh. And you may live a hundred years living your life your own way in rebellion against God. But my friends, the reality is that one day you will die. And the Bible says that when you die, that you'll stand before your Creator in judgment and He'll judge you according to His righteousness. Not what you think, but according to His righteousness. So my friends, I beg you to turn from sin and turn to Christ while there's still time. Please do that today. Don't neglect this great offer of salvation that God gives you. Because one day we all draw our last breath. And even though you may think you're going to live forever, when you're young you tend to think that. The older you get, the more you'll see you won't. And the faster time seems to go, and the closer to death you get, the more the reality sets in. So please today, turn from your sin and turn to Christ while there's time. There may not be time. You may not have another day. Nobody knows when they're going to die, really. So please, my friends, turn from sin and turn to Christ and put your faith and your trust in Him and Him alone. And see, now you're proclaiming allegiance to your God, Satan. And that, that affirms the Bible because it says that you're either a child of God or a child of Satan. So this young man will by and proclaim his allegiance to his God, Satan. So it's either one or the other. You can't be neutral, by the way. The gospel is not a neutral message. And you can't just not do anything. By rejecting the offer of salvation, you've actually rejected Christ. And therefore, you're still in your sin. And my friend, if you die in your sin, then Jesus will say to you, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. So my friends, please don't, please don't go to this awful place called the Lake of Fire. Please don't go there. The young man asked earlier, if there was no hell, would I still worship God? Well, certainly, because I don't worship Him out of fear of hell. That was a great motivator to turn from sin, and it should motivate you. But we serve God and worship Him out of love. He came and freely gave Himself and sacrificed Himself for sinners like you and I. So please. Don't neglect that. Don't abuse that. Just accept it. <laughs> Repent and put your trust in Christ. It's simple. So why is it so difficult? Why do you reject that offer? Why do you not want to be forgiven of your sins? Why do you not want to have eternal life? And why do you want to go and live in the lake of fire forever? It's because your desire for sin is so strong and your love for sin is so strong that you suppress the truth and unrighteousness even to the point of trying to convince yourself and everyone around you that you're an atheist and God does not exist when in fact you know He is real because He has revealed Himself through the creation and through your very conscience, you know that God is real. So what sin is it that you love so much that it's worth forfeiting your eternity and spending it in the lake of fire paying for your own sin debt? See, here's what happens. See, sin will be paid for God demands payment for sin, and He will have payment for sin. And Jesus came to accept the payment for our sin on the cross. And if we repent and trust Him, what He did on the cross is counted as our payment for our sin, and we are given His righteousness. Now you can either repent and trust Him and let what He did on the cross pay your debt, or you can reject it, and when you die, Jesus will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, and you will be cast into the lake of fire where you will pay your own sin debt for eternity. But your sin debt, my friend, will be paid for. Either Jesus paid for it, or you will pay for it. But God will receive payment for sin because He is a loving, just, true, righteous, holy God, and He must do what is right because otherwise He would violate His own nature. And He will not violate His own nature and character. 
So my friends, it's a fact your sin will be punished. It's a fact you are a sinner. It's a fact you will die. It's a fact you will stand before God in judgment. So when you stand before Him, what will you bring to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Will you bring the righteousness of Christ because you repented and put your trust in Him? Or will you stand on your own merit where all your righteous deeds are even like filthy minstrel cloths? And He will say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. That's the option. It's either Jesus or the lake of fire. That's the only option there is. So my friends, I beg you, repent and trust Christ. Repent and put your trust in Christ. Don't go to this horrible place. Do not go to this While you're walking the streets of Athens. While you're walking the streets of Athens. Think about this. If you're walking in rebellion to God, you know what the Bible says you're doing? It says you're storing up wrath for the day of wrath. Have a good night. So my friends, the wrath of God abides on you if you're outside of Christ. So my friends, please turn from your sin, repent and put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone. There's no other hope you have. There's no hope in any other religion, any other person, a religious figure. Jesus is the only way. He came, He was born of a virgin, lived 33 sinless years, was beaten, was nailed to a cross where He died, was buried, and on the third day He rose from the dead, and He did that to save sinners like you and I, if you'll just repent and put your trust in Him and Him alone.